introduce uh, Dr. Ashikun Henry uh, from Georgia Tech. He will be talking about uh, understanding uh, phonon transport uh, using lattice dynamics and molecular dynamics. He will have a, a lecture this morning and one uh, this afternoon. And uh, I'm personally looking forward to, to hearing your talk. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, this talk is largely organized as one long talk. I'll bring up the outline, uh, but I'm going to break it into two parts. So we'll do a, a morning session, a morning phase, and a uh, early, late morning, I guess, mid uh, early afternoon phase as well. So in the first portion, what I would like to cover um, is a lot of foundational stuff. So some, some of this may seem boring. I will try to... Um, keep it interesting and exciting by showing lots of movies. And hopefully that'll keep you engaged. It's for those who are very familiar with some of these aspects of this topic. Uh, but I think it's, it's important to review these basic foundational concepts. Um, and for the, for the purpose specifically of uh, defining the terminology that I want to use going forward so that we're all on the same page of at least what I mean when I say a phonon, a normal mode, you know, what I mean by uh, Propagons, diffusons, locons, those kinds of things. And so uh, for me, in my, in my view, those things are very well-defined, well very clear, rigorous things that um, are important to clarify what it is and what the framework is that I think about, that I use when I think about phonon transport. And so I want to expose you and walk you through uh, what that looks like today. And that whole perspective really relies on two general methodologies that we've essentially married and brought together. The first is considered lattice dynamics, which essentially involves solving the equations of motion of a system of masses that are interacting with some kind of effective spring constant, uh, solving those equations in the, the limit that those springs are perp perfectly described as Hooke's law, one-half kx squared, types of uh, spring, uh, spring energy and kx forces. And then also molecular dynamics, which is the process of actually going through a numerical simulation process of solving Newton's equations when you deviate significantly from this harmonic limit, uh, from this, this limit of these idealized springs. And so uh, we combine those two because in reality, the motion of atoms is anharmonic. Um, but the harmonic solutions serve as a very important and useful basis set that we use to project the anharmonic motions onto, which reveal lots of interesting and important phenomena. And that's lots of, uh, a lot of that is basically in the second half of the talk, and so that, that'll be more so in the late morning, early afternoon portion, where I will then start to go through some of the examples of things that we have realized, insights that we have derived from utilizing this general framework, this general approach from studying materials uh, and, and, the, and the premise of this is largely that we have been after um, an approach that essentially will describe phonon transport in general. In general, meaning that the only requirement, the only caveat that is, is applied here is that we assume or we, we, we expect that where this is applicable is when atoms vibrate about some kind of equilibrium position. That's the only requirement. And what that entails is that then means this formalism, this approach that I'm going to show you can apply to crystalline solids, any kinds of defects you have in solids, amorphous materials, alloys, doesn't matter what level of disorder. If you want to simulate two grains touching, it doesn't matter. Interfaces, individual molecules. This is also another important application. Um, and in all of those cases, None of the math changes. None of the assumptions change. None of the perspective changes. The math is identical in all cases. So we tried to come up with essentially a grand unified theory of phonon transport that basically encompasses all of those cases all at once in one coherent framework. So what is, what is a phonon? What is a phonon gas model? So I want to talk about this notion of the phonon gas model because as, as I'll argue, it, it underlies a lot of the perception of how we view phonon transport or have viewed it for the last hundred years. And the uh, new approach that we have developed is essentially uh, trying to fill in some important holes and gaps in where that model breaks down. So what's a phonon? So if you ask somebody what's a phonon, the typical thing people will say is, well, it's a quanta of lattice vibrational energy. 
And to some extent, I would agree with that because that is what it is in the context of a perfect crystal. And that's usually the orientation, the starting point that many people use to think about what a phonon is. And so the implication is that in a crystal, I have a periodic lattice. All the atoms are arranged periodically. And if I solve the equations of motion, all of my solutions are going to look like some form of plane wave or some kind of sinusoidally modulated uh, vibrations. Those vibrations, of course, have some frequency. So the energy associated with a mode, a normal mode of vibration, is h bar omega, quantum mechanically. These uh, solutions also have a characteristic wavelength, which we convert to a k vector. And we can talk about different directions for a certain plane wave. There's a phonon speed, a phase speed, and also what we call a group velocity. Now, the group velocity comes from this basic concept that I have these solutions, but one solution by itself does not transport any heat. It doesn't move any, any, any energy anywhere. And so I have to combine solutions. I have to take multiple wavelengths and add them together. And what that does is it creates a localized wave packet. And so you'll see that there's a displacement field that's localized in space. If you evolve that in time, that localized bump actually moves and it translates. That translation happens at what we call the group velocity, which is the derivative of frequency with respect to the wave vector. Okay? And so this forms the very fundamental basis for what we call the phonon gas models. This premise that when you add these solutions together, you get a wave packet. That wave packet moves at a certain speed. And that speed, as these modes are collectively working together to move energy, that packet now has a certain distance it can travel or a certain time that it can stay together before that energy starts to dissipate and get uh, coupled into other modes and the whole thing fizzles out and it's similar to essentially sound wave attenuation. And so the phonon gas model is this idea that I can treat that displacement bump, that wave packet, as if it is a quasi-particle, as if it's effectively like a little particle that moves at this speed called the group velocity carrying energy h bar omega. And so here's the, here's the phonon gas model mathematically. It ultimately boils down to this expression where we make an analogy between the way that particles would transport energy in a gas. So if you have a gas of molecules, you have the energy carried by each particle, which is the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared. You multiply by velocity, divide by the volume, and this gives you heat flux. And by analogy, what we say is, well, phonons must do the exact same thing. So Phonons don't have any mass, so they have the energy h bar omega, but I'm going to multiply by velocity and divide by volume. And this basic expression for how it is that you express the heat flux associated with a phonon is what I would call the phonon gas model itself. This is mathematically what it boils down to. And I would argue that over 90% of all the literature you see on phonons all starts with this kind of expression. And this expression, I'm saying, is an assumption. This expression is not proved from any first principles. It's simply derived via analogy to this expression. And so there's no reason that it can't be wrong. All right? It's simply something that seems to make sense when you have modes that you can add together, form wave packets, and the whole story carries forward. And so what I'm going to show you, the reason we developed a more general approach is because there are many cases where those assumptions, all the assumptions in that train of logic, one of them breaks down. And then this expression now becomes questionable whether or not it's valid. But in the end, you end up with an expression for thermal conductivity if you follow this approach uh, that has a familiar form, heat capacity times uh, a velocity times mean free path. So why do we believe in this phonon gas model? Well, because it works. Especially if you're talking about a crystalline material, it seems to make sense. We can do it fully from first principles. So um, Kayvon talked about this yesterday. This works really, really well. Get great agreement between exp uh, experiment and theory. And it also explains one of the most important effects that has been discussed in phonon literature over the last couple decades, which is this notion of classical size effects. So the idea is that I'm treating phonons as though they are these little particles that translate. They, yes? Yeah, in a sense, I'm, I'm arguing that where this model came from is by analogy of, you know, this is the energy associated with the molecule, and you've replaced that with the quantum energy of a phone. I'm so, it's, hard, it's hard to hear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure how what you're saying is relevant to this issue, but what, but what, what do you mean? 
Okay. Okay, even if I take what you're saying to be true, does it, I, don't, I don't think it changes any of my points, but yes, okay, yes, there could be some distribution. All right, and so um, one, of these, one of these main effects that, that the photon gas model describes very well is this notion of classical size effects. So you have particles that are essentially moving, and these things can be scattered. So let me talk about this term scattering. This term scattering is, in my opinion, used... Uh, very loosely throughout our community. And I think we need to be very careful about how we use that terminology because we use it to essentially describe anything going on with phonons. We just say scattering, scattering. It's all because of scattering, right? But that's, to me, I'll, I'll show you some examples of some things that I think we need to be very careful about how we utilize that word. But the point is that in this model, everything occurs because of scattering, meaning Thermal conductivity ultimately depends on this mean free path or the relaxation time or the time between scattering events. Any reduction in this ultimately results in a reduction of thermal conductivity. And so there are different scattering mechanisms, an alloying element, a defect, an isotope, an interface, a boundary. All of those things can serve as different means or mechanisms of, of scattering that add on to the natural intrinsic phonon phonon scattering that happens due to anharmonicity. And so the idea is that if you start to make a sample or a material that's small, you start to shrink the size, phonons will start to scatter with the boundaries more often than they scatter with each other. And this mean free path will reduce and thermal conductivity will correspondingly reduce. And so you get things like this, like for silicon nanowires, as thermal conductivity goes down, as the mean free path goes down, as the diameter goes down. And all this is essentially pretty well explained and understood through this phonon gas model. And this is one of the main reasons we believe in it. So what's the problem with this approach? So my argument is that the, the inherent issue with the phonon gas model is that it presupposes, it assumes that all the modes have a velocity. It presupposes that they all have a, that as, a, as a useful descriptor. It's part of their description. And, it rig and, and, and the notion that all the phonons are going to have velocity rigorously requires that you have perfect periodicity and you have dispersion. That's how you get the velocities. And so in cases where you don't have periodicity, this starts to break down, and I would argue that the whole model starts to break down. And so this notion of periodicity assumes some plane wave-like character. All right? That's what is assumed about the modes and the way they look. This approach itself was derived by analogy, not necessarily based on any fundamental principle, and therefore it's not general. And I'm going to argue that it's a bit disjoint with the atomic level view. So I'll ask you two questions that hopefully will give you some food for thought to think about how the actual motion of atoms is somehow not consistent with this notion of particles that move and then scatter. So the first question is, well, how long does a scattering event even take? We often talk about the time between scattering events, but how long is the event itself? The notion of using this term scattering presupposes a certain physical picture. It presupposes that you have this mode, these modes, this phonon, this quasi-particle, and it travels for some period of time. And that period of time, you know, if you're going to use the word term, the term scattering, that time of flight should probably be much longer than the time of interaction between when it hits something and does something else. And so we treat phonon scattering with this really cartoonish, fictitious view that phonons travel, and then they have this instantaneous scattering event, and then they do something different. And this is really some you know, statistically average picture that we utilize to describe thermal conductivity and transport, but it's disjoint with the, actually what is happening in the dynamics of the atoms. So I want to play something for you as an example, try to illustrate for you how distinctly different uh, the real dynamics are from this physical picture of, you know, uh, rigid, uh, uh, quick changes in trajectory of, of energy. You don't hear any of that if you actually listen to the motion of atoms. So one of the things we've started to do is actually what we call sonify the data in a molecular dynamic simulation. So we'll take an atom, for example, and convert its velocity as a function of time to a sound file. So you can actually hear what an atom moving actually sounds like. The reason that's important is because if phonon scattering, if that physical picture was real, what you should hear is a frequency have a certain amplitude, and then you should hear a, dra a drastic shift. You should hear some step functions in the amplitude of different frequencies. And when I play it for you, you won't hear any of that. And the reason I'm saying that that's important is because, again, this picture, this notion of phonon scattering is disjoint with the actual dynamics of how atoms are actually moving. So this is the sound of one silicon atom at room temperature.
I can play that again for anyone who, who's, who's interested later. But this is what has formed a lot of my opinions and a lot of my perspective about what phone on transport really is. And it's a very big departure from the physical picture that we often use, which is based on the phone on gas model. And so what I want to talk about today, what I ultimately want to get to is, an well, another question you can think about is, well, why would only the modes with similar wavelength add together and not others? What's so special about a wave packet? If I can add solutions together, why should I only add the solutions of similar wavelength? In theory, I should be able to add any solutions I want. So what's so special about that? This is another fundamental question that we're still trying to answer. Um, and what I want to ultimately get to in this first uh, half of the talk is really, what's the general and rigorous connection between this notion of phonons and the atomic vibrations? Yes? No, that's, that's real time velocity as a function of time where we simply scaled the time axis by a factor of about a billion so that you can actually hear it. So it's not terahertz, but kilohertz. No, no other filtering or, or, or modification of the data. Yes, V of T. How did you produce this sound? So, so if you do a molecular dynamic simulation, what comes out of that is then the position and velocity of every atom as a function of time. So we just pick one atom. Pick one atom and now record that as a function of time. And then it, it's actually really easy. There's a one-line command in MATLAB. You can convert any oscillatory signal directly to a sound file. Uh, it's just a reformatting of the data so that it actually an audio player can re read and detect it. And you have to put it at the right sampling rate. Yes? Was that silicon system was all periodic or yes. there was, okay. Yes, and there are so many interesting things I, could, I, could, I can tell you about things that we've sonified that are, you, you can hear the difference. So for example, um, and I have examples of this I could pull up if you want, uh, if we make an interface, okay, and that interface is strained, let's say it's, we force an interface between silicon and germanium, so one lattice constant in the, in, the, in the lateral directions is being, or two directions is being forced to be something if we lattice match it by, uh, by strain, but the, the, but the third dimension is not strained. You can actually hear the difference between the atom motion in X and Y versus Z. It actually sounds different. You can actually hear the strain. And so these are the kinds of things that to me provide immense insight into the actual physics, right? And so to me, when you talk about atomic vibration, it's moving particles, it's moving masses. So we can use these kinds of tools and keep this idea, these ideas very physical, stay very close to the real physical picture rather than having to jump to this notion of phonons that, you know, with particles and scattering and then it kind of gets far away from the physical reality. All right, so let's start with some foundation. Let me see how much time I have. Okay. So uh, atoms in this framework are treated essentially as rigid bodies. This turns out to be a pretty good approximation unless you go to really low temperatures where the notion of the wave, the, the, the wave function of the nucleus itself starts to spread out. Uh, but at, at moderate temperatures, this uh, turns out to be a good approximation. Atoms vibrate. That's the main key underpinning of this whole approach, of this whole perspective, is that where this analysis becomes valid is when atoms are vibrating around some equilibrium position. Uh, think of them as like rigid balls connected by springs. The springs are linear in this, one, in this one limit that I'm going to talk about, where the energy is described as 1 half kx squared, force is uh, kx. And then uh, we can solve, whenever this is the case, if you have any kind of dynamical system like this, you can solve the equations of motion analytically. All right? And ultimately, you can also visualize the motion. This is now uh, molecular dynamics. This, I'll just show you one movie of an MD simulation. And so atoms will jiggle around, and they move around whereby you can solve and harmonically, if you have different uh, deviations from this, you can get force equal to mass times acceleration, and you can track numerically the positions and velocities of the atoms in time. And this becomes a very useful perspective because for every individual material, a particular arrangement of atoms, you can get the you know, corresponding dynamics. You can include atomic level detail. So let's start from this notion of the equations of motion, just a basic review. If I have a single mass and spring. I have some equilibrium site, x0. That's where the spring is fully relaxed, has zero energy. If I deform the spring and move the mass to location x, I have this deformation. I'll call it big X. Energy is 1 half kx squared. Force is then the, minus the derivative with respect to x of this energy. You get minus kx. Force is mass times acceleration. And so I can write this basic equation of motion 
which I can then solve, all right? So it says that d squared x dt squared is minus k x over m. And so the idea is, well, I need to know what x is. So I want to solve it analytically. This says two derivatives of this function x are equivalent to the same function with a prefactor, k over m. And so we'll say one function that easily satisfies this is sine and cosine, all right? These are periodic functions. And they satisfy this where you get this prefactor of minus omega squared out front. So then omega squared must be equal to this. And then that tells you the frequency. And so you get the full solution as the addition of both possible solutions, sine and cosine. And you can describe the motion of the atom, or I mean, the motion of the mass. And we're going to treat atoms identically like this, as though the atoms are the mass. And they're interconnected with other atoms via springs. And so this is all basic, you know, first level, first, I don't want to say first year, maybe second or third year mechanical engineering undergraduate uh, stuff. But I just want to reiterate that this is, this, is, this, is, this is proven, well understood. You can do a macroscopic experiment. There's no ambiguity here. There's no question about whether or not this is right, OK? And so you know, we understand how these things change with different frequencies, changing the mass. You can, measure it, you can measure it macroscopically and confirm that all of this is true. All right, so now the question becomes, well, what if I have multiple masses? Hmm. So let's take a little bit more time to go through this a little bit more carefully. Hopefully, the first case is very easy to understand. So in the second case, I have two equations of motion, right? So I have the force, I have mass times acceleration for the first mass. It's got two springs attaching it, one to some rigid body, one to the other mass. Same goes for the other uh, mass. I keep wanting to say atom. <laughs> Same, uh, the other mass, get another corresponding equation. And when you then recognize this frequency of square root of k over m, call that omega naught, the equation simplified to this, where you just divide out m, both have the same mass, m, all right? k over m gives you this. Uh, you get this square root of k over m quantity, you square it, right? And so you get these two equations, and this gives you an al algebraic expression if you have this uh, uh, solution here. Um, you get this algebraic expression where it's a relationship between frequency and the amplitudes, a, a1 and a2, of the motion of each sine and cosine wave, all right? And again, I know this will seem very, very basic, very, very simple, simple and uh, maybe boring to many of you, but Humor me, because it's important that I want to point out some features of this as we go along that are important, because they show up later when we now talk about n atoms in a very large system with lots of degrees of freedom. Some of these same features show up. All right, so the core oscillatory function is in every term, and it factors out. That's how you get this kind of expression. And these algebraic equations, the roots of them reveal the different characteristic frequencies of vibration. Very, very important. So two masses gives you two modes, two what we call normal modes, two solutions to the equations of motion, two distinct ones. And each one has a specific frequency associated with it and direction. So the first sol solution you get is where this omega hat uh, is one, all right? And the other is where you get root three. And these are the two um, uh, uh, solutions you get for the corresponding values you get for the values of the uh, amplitude. So you get a, a1 equals a2 or a1 equals minus a2. Now, at, even at this small level, I want to show you and I want to indicate that these two things correspond to uh, terminology that when you get to now n atoms, you may be familiar with. So this is like the acoustic mode, all right? The two masses are moving in the same direction. You get one frequency, OK? The two masses moving in opposite directions, counter to each other. You get another frequency, but interestingly, this frequency is actually greater than one. It's greater than this natural frequency of just having one mass. So the addition of multiple masses, same spring constant, same mass, enabled accession of vibrations at frequencies higher than the natural frequency of one mass by itself. Very important concept, because this shows up as we go further. So one thing I want to point out when you watch this video, so that, you, know, you get these solutions, it's got phase as well. Um, is that just watching two masses, two solutions, very quickly, it can start to look a little bit chaotic. Even though it's only two solutions, there's only two modes here. Oops. All right, so this is one mode. The two masses are moving in the same direction. The next one is 
the other solution and move in an opposite direction. And then you can do linear combinations of the two modes. And what you will see is, because the two frequencies are not the same, it starts to almost look a little bit chaotic, right? If you just follow one mass, if you follow one, right, the motion actually looks a little bit irregular. But this is just two modes. And the reason I bring this up is because I always hear people say things like, oh, well, you know, you have atoms vibrating around equilibrium, and the vibrations are random. They're not random. If they were random, thermal conductivity would be zero, okay? The, at, the atom motions are not actually random. And it's actually the, the lack of randomness that actually is responsible for thermal conductivity. It's responsible for thermal transport. And so just because something looks random doesn't mean it actually is. And that's essentially what we'll get to later is that we actually measure the degree to which it's not random. And that's how we get heat conduction. <laughs> or let me say that's how we get the transport coefficients. So if you now have a linear chain, so you can generalize this, you have more, than, more and more masses. The equations, all the equations for all the masses start to look similar. They look very similar to like a wave equation. This is all the more reason why we should use waves to describe these things, and this is why all that makes sense. The solutions start to look like this, where you have a displacement profile times a time-dependent term. Okay, so these are actually like standing waves, not propagating waves. Important distinction. But anyway, if you follow now the various frequencies that you get for the different solutions, you generalize this to n different modes. Here's a case of four different masses. You get these various modes. Eventually, you get this notion of a phonon dispersion. Or you get this notion of a dispersion or a relationship between the frequency of the solution, that characteristic eigenvalue, and the associated wavelength of the way that the uh, particles or the masses are moving. Right? So you get an, a, a sinusoidal modulation to those, those things. And again, to this point, there's a natural frequency, square root of k over m. That falls in the middle of the dispersion relation. So you get a bunch of frequencies that are higher than that, and you get a bunch of frequencies that are uh, lower than that. And the bigger it gets, eventually this extends down to zero, and this extends up to twice the uh, natural frequency. All right, so you can generalize this to three dimensions, so you don't have to just have these particles moving in 1D. They can move in all three dimensions. They can be interconnected with other masses in three dimensions. And this more general approach of doing this in 3D is what we term, what I, what I mean when I, call this, when I say the term lattice dynamics, okay? So this process of solving the equations of motion in general in three dimensions is what I call lattice dynamics. Now, what it, what it boils down to is now you generalize this such that any two particles can have some kind of effective spring between them. It becomes really, really hard to draw that and illustrate that, but essentially these are like interactions between atoms. So it doesn't just have to be one atom interacting with its nearest atoms. It can interact with atoms that are even further. And so each of those springs is described by spring constant, like this K right here, where you have the derivative, second derivative of the energy with respect to one displacement of one atom in one direction and another atom in another direction. Okay? And this gives you a bunch of different spring constants. And these spring constants are what uniquely describe a specific material and give you the phonon dispersion. That said, the same solution pr procedure applies. You can solve this analytically. And this ultimately boils down from here. You get, uh, uh, if you have a periodic system, I'm going to come back to this. Uh, if you have a periodic system, you can, you can represent it in terms of wave vectors because all your solutions look like these plane waves that I described on the previous slide here. So this is where k vector showed up. This k vector showed up because every one of these masses and every one of these springs was identical. The springs don't have to be identical, but as long as the masses are the same and you have uh, periodicity, this k vector shows up and all the solutions fall into this ni neat, nice and neat organization of the solutions. And so it becomes useful to collapse those solutions. You can easily talk about what happens in the, sy the infinite system size limit by using this k vector. So that's where this comes from. This becomes a polarization vector. So this is like the values of A1 and A2. These now have to be generalized into three dimensions. This is expressed with an imaginary number. So this vector is also imaginary. But in, in essence, the final values of displacement are real vectors. All right? And so these vectors describe what direction and in what magnitude is each of the atoms in this system moving as it participates in this particular solution to the equations of motion. Now, how many solutions do you get? If I have n atoms, I have three degrees of freedom for every atom, x, y, and z, you end up with three n solutions, three n different 
modes. Each solution is what I call a normal mode. All right, so that's what I mean when I say a normal mode. It is a solution, a rigorous solution to the harmonic equations of motion. Okay. So what comes out of all that is you can write a matrix equation, you can get the frequencies, the eigenvalues, you can get the frequency associated with each of those modes, and you will get the eigenvectors, the direction that each atom is moving as it participates in each collective vibration or each normal mode. This process is so critical, and it sounds, it may seem very straightforward, very easy, but there is tremendous insight that can be gained by simply looking at these solutions and actually looking at the character of the vibrations in certain systems. All right. So each solution to the equations of motion is a mode. A phonon is essentially a quasi-particle now associated with each integer increase in amplitude of a mode. All right, so let me, we talked about classical. Let me bring now in the quantum reality. So if you now go back and solve this same problem, quantum mechanically, you get essentially the exact same solution, except what happens is that Instead of these amplitudes of the modes now being continuous variables that can take on any value, they take on integer values. So they can have one amplitude or one integer step larger in amplitude and nothing in between. And so that has very important consequences for things like heat capacity and also possibly the dynamics of how the modes are interacting as well. But that's really the only main difference that comes in with quantum mechanics. So essentially the normal modes of vibration that you calculate classically are still valid, they're still meaningful, they still tell you something. And what changes is then when you go to quantum mechanics, the uh, mode amplitudes are quantized. The energy is now quantized. All right. So now let's get to this notion of wave packets. So if you add together multiple solutions, we'll keep with this uh, motif of using an infinite crystalline material where everything's periodic. Multiple solutions add together, and you get a wave packet. This wave packet then moves in space. And this is where this notion of the uh, phonon gas model starts to take shape. Right? And so you can see this packet moving in space, moving and translating, and that motion happens at what we call the group velocity. And there's some average wavelength associated with all the wavelengths or the different modes that you added together. And so groups of individual modes are what move the energy, not an individual mode. When I talk about an individual mode, when I say that term, what I mean is one solution to the equations of motion, not a group, one. And this picture is now where the, the PGM, I would say, originated or where it comes from. So let me show you an example of what's, what happens when you have, for example, an interface. So now you have a material that's one material on one side, another material on the other side. In this case, all we did was change the mass. We solved these uh, equations of motion. And what, one of the things we found when we did this is we noticed one of the solutions is actually localized, meaning that the polarization vectors the vectors that describe how each atom is moving are only significantly large for the atoms that are right near the interface itself. They become zero when you get further away. This is an interesting effect. So what this means is that this is a localized normal mode of vibration. Seems totally weird that somehow, I, and this, this what you're seeing in these videos is an actual molecular dynamic simulation, all right? So what we've done is we've actually moved the atoms, started them off, or given them velocities that uh, are proportional and correspond to these vectors that are exact, exactly described by the eigenvectors coming from the normal mode solution, the, uh, the, the, the solution to the equations of motion. And so at the beginning of the simulation, this is what we start with. And one nanosecond later, which is a really long time in molecular dynamics, you see the exact same thing happening. Why do you see the exact same thing happening? Because this mode is a unique solution to the equations of motion. If these atoms move exactly in these directions with these magnitudes, they can stably oscillate without coupling to any other mode. The modes, the normal modes that you solve for are orthogonal in the sense that as long as these displacements are sufficiently small, the anharmonicity is too weak to really couple them together over any significant time scale that we can probe. And as a result, they will continue to oscillate indefinitely like this. All right, this is very important. So a mode is a stable form of oscillation that the system can make. And it's very, it's very non-intuitive, at least to me, that you can create an, a solution like that that will localize around an interface. It's amazing that none of the other atoms have to move in order for these atoms to move in exactly these ways. But this is why the solutions to the equations of motion are so valuable, because they tell you that solutions like this can exist. And this is important. So now let me show you what happens when we simply, all we did was move one vector by a few degrees. And immediately what happens in the MD simulation is something different. All right, so immediately that one mode 
that we were almost exciting immediately couples to all kinds of other vibrations. Atoms throughout the entire system begin to move. And this is within a, within a couple picoseconds. So a thousand times shorter time scale, immediate coupling happens when you deviate from these exact solutions to the equations of motion. These things are very valuable because they tell you how the system can move in a, an individual frequency, where all the atoms oscillate about zero at one frequency. And so when you deviate from that, you get chaos. You get coupling, you have you're exciting more than one mode, and modes begin to interact and all kinds of other things ha start to happen. All right, so now what happens when you have disorder? So if I have a perfect crystalline material and I start replacing atoms with a different type of atom, let's say a substitutional alloy, what immediately starts to happen is the character of the solutions changes, and it changes dramatically. So you still get some solutions that look like plane waves in the low frequency limit, because eventually as you go to zero frequency, you should always get like sound waves. So some waves become so low frequency, it's almost like a density wave moving through the material. It doesn't really matter how, how disordered it is, and they will still look like sound waves. These we, we call propagons. But it turns out the majority of the vibrations don't look like that. The majority of the vibrations look like this. And these vectors look almost completely random. They look random because the composition is random. So these vectors, rep these vectors uh, correspond to or reflect the underlying variation in composition, which seems random. These make up the majority of the vibrations. These we call diffusons. These modes are delocalized. They extend through the entire system, all right? But there doesn't appear to be any particular pattern or periodicity in, the, in these vectors. So you're getting away from this sinusoidal-looking picture of how the mode amplitude even looks. And then in the high-frequency regime, you often get these localized modes. So if you've got an atom, Think about it this way. If I have an atom, you stand on top of that atom, you look around you, and if your atomic environment is really, really different than any other atom in the entire uh, material, you will require a special set of solutions to describe your emotion because you experience something very different than everyone else. And so you end up with localized solutions. So if you've got an atom, for example, in this alloy that happens to be fully coordinated with the same kinds of atoms, and this, that's very rare, usually you at least have one of another type of atom, then you may have a very high frequency solution that's local to that atom that describes how that atom moves versus everything else. And so you get localization. And so these we call locons. Yeah. Uh, propagons from diffusons or diffusons from locons. Absolutely so, correct. There's no, you know, so this to me gets to the, the beauty and um, what is so special about heat. <laughs> There's no rules, right? So it's really hard to make these vibrations do what you want them to do. They don't have to do anything. You can get, I'll show you an example where uh, we developed a method to actually distinguish the difference between the propagons and the diffusons. And for quite some time, it had been thought that there was like this cutoff frequency. After the certain frequency like this, you would just see diffusons. But we'll, I'll show you an example where you see some overlap. You'll see some propagons at slightly higher frequencies and some diffusons at slightly lower frequencies. There does tend to be, at least so far from what we've, we've determined, there does tend to be a frequency regime where you see a significant transition in the mode character. And it happens, it generally tends to happen pretty quick. But that's not a rule. There's no reason that has to be the case. I'm definitely sure I could dream up a structure where I can make that transition much more uh, gradual, okay? This same thing, and where these names, propagons, diffusons, and locons came from, where this originated was from um, Allen and Feldman's seminal work in the 90s, looking at the modes in amorphous materials. And so what, what they found is that propagons, diffusons, and locons exist in amorphous materials when now the structure is disordered. So whether it's compositional disorder or structural disorder, both of them induce these new types of phonons. All right? And so my argument is that these types of modes should be equally considered phonons just like the ones that look pure, perfectly like a sinusoid. There's no reason to use a new piece of terminology because all the math is identical. And there's no uh, rigid boundary between one type of behavior and another because you can make modes that continuously transition in between these two extremes. Yes, you had a question? <clears throat> So I'll show you some uh, examples of this. We've actually measured how these modes evolve as a function of disorder, but in this case you're looking at here, this is roughly a 50-50 alloy. <clears throat> so this is about as disordered as it gets. <clears throat> 
All right, so we've talked a lot about now normal modes and this notion of um, harmonic equations of motion and the solutions that you get. I now want to talk about anharmonicity because we know from crystals that anharmonicity can be important. It plays a significant role. And so if you had a system of masses and springs where all of those interactions are perfectly described by Hooke's law, one-half kx squared, if you solve those equations of motion, all the solutions you get are orthogonal. What do I mean by orthogonal? That means that if you start the state in one state of vibration, it will indefinitely stay in that state. There is no quote-unquote interaction between the modes. Every single mode's amplitude will stay constant in time. They will never change. That's a function, that's a natural consequence of this notion of having purely, anharmon uh, purely harmonic interactions. So it leads to a, essentially a non-interacting system of normal modes. So the modes and the mode amplitudes don't change in time. But in reality, we know that that cannot be true. It cannot be absolutely true that you have this symmetric well in which atoms vibrate. There has to be asymmetry. Where does this asymmetry come from? The asymmetry, by definition, from my perspective, originates from the fact that the bonds between atoms have finite bonding energy. By the fact that the bonding energy has to be finite, then the energy well has to, at some point, become concave down. It has to change in concavity so that it goes to zero energy so you can pull the atoms apart and break the bond. All right, and so because of that, you by definition always have to have some anharmonicity. And so anharmonicity is the deviation from that perfectly harmonic or parabolic well that atoms could sit in. And this requires that the potential energy be not be symmetric and causes mode-to-mode -mode interaction. So now, when you're now in an, in an anharmonic situation, which is reality, these modes are still useful. All right, the harmonic solutions are useful because they help you understand the anharmonic vibration. But what is happening now in the real anharmonic system is that the amplitudes of the modes are changing in time. The anharmonicity causes mode amplitudes to evolve in time and fluctuate. So this is one example. I'll just keep showing you guys movies to try and keep you awake. So this is a water molecule. Uh, it's going to dissociate. And so the, the fact that you have this finite dissociation energy, again, requires that the potential cannot be a perfect parabola infinitely far out. It has to, at some point, become concave down so that you can get to zero energy and break the bond. And so you'll see one of these hydrogen atoms get pulled from the oxygen and go on to another oxygen. All right, and so this, this process here is bond breaking. And the fact that that happens in reality means that the potential has to be asymmetric. All right, so in general, when you now talk about anharmonic vibrations, you can't, in general, solve it analytically. There may be some cases where you can design a particular anharmonic interaction where you can get an analytic solution, but not in general, and, and almost definitely not when you have real anharmonic interactions in a real material. And so we want to solve this numerically. You can solve it numerically, and what that looks like is now this notion of molecular dynamics. So you need a model for the interactions. Um, I'm not going to talk much about how we get these today. But suffice it to say that people spend a lot of time trying to develop these models that describe how atoms interact in a given system and a given material. And we are making good strides towards actually being able to do that better with greater fidelity, without any fitting parameters, without any adjustable parameters, such that you can now describe phonon transport without any intrinsic assumptions about the atomic uh, interactions. It's fully derived from first principles. But the MD simulations themselves are classical in nature. Again, we're making this assumption that the masses are treated as rigid, rigid bodies subject to Newton's law, F equals MA. We're not solving Schrodinger equation to describe the, to describe the motion. Uh, and an atom equals a point particle. And you can use something called like the Verrilay algorithm, which does a really good job of giving you a stable dynamics where you can actually observe what's happening. You generally need small time steps. So the way this occurs is you have the atoms set at certain positions. This is your starting point. You may give them initial velocities. And then what you do is you say, OK, some finite amount of time later, say a femtosecond, very small amount of time later, where will all the atoms be? And you write down the equations of motion, and you have some description of what the instantaneous forces would be on all the atoms given their locations. This model for the interactions is usually an explicit function of where all the atoms are located. So if two atoms are really close, they want to push each other apart. So you're going to get a big force pushing them apart. Two atoms are really far away. You might feel a force. They might feel a force attracting them together. So it's an explicit function of where the atoms are located. You get the forces. Once you know the force, you divide that by each atom's mass. That gives you its acceleration. 
If you know acceleration, you can now predict, use a predictor out algorithm to predict some finite of time in the future where it should be. And this actually works very, very well, and you can uh, do a good job of predicting where the atoms will be. We also often use, uh, or the output of this, is then what we call the anharmonic trajectory. So this is the position and the velocity of every atom as a function of time throughout the entire history of the time that you simulated. All right? So we typically run these simulations with time steps on the order of femtoseconds. We typically run for phonon transport times that uh, uh, simulations as long as multiple nanoseconds, tens of nanoseconds, to actually capture all the dynamics associated with a given material system. We also often employ periodic boundary conditions. This is where we essentially put the material or the system in contact with itself. All right, And so the atoms on this side are seeing the atoms on this side as their neighbors, as immediately in contact with them. And this helps us to drastically reduce the size of the simulation that we have to simulate to now replicate the effects of what happens in an infinitely large bulk material. All right, so again, I kind of walked through this verbally already. You have this uh, simulation procedure. You have initial positions, initial velocities. You use those positions to evaluate your potential energy function, which is often an empirical expression which is specific to the chemistry that you have, that you're interested in. Take the negative gradient of the potential energy to get the force on every atom. Calculate the acceleration, predict new positions. And then you go through this process of just updating and repeating that process. So you can use something like the Verley algorithm, which here where you take a Taylor expansion forward in time and backward in time, uh, add the two together, and then you get that the future position of an atom is purely a function of its current location, where it was previously and the acceleration. And this becomes a very stable algorithm because it doesn't require to use, you to use information about the velocity. And so, um, because velocity information has some in intrinsic error in it because it would be based on other information you have. So this is a really stable algorithm because you're utilizing all the information that you're sure about. You know where the atoms were, you know what the accelerations are, and you know where they are right now. All right, so we know the Harmonic limit gives you the solutions, the modes, the phonons, the normal modes. The anharmonic motions come from molecular dynamics. And the mode amplitudes, if you had the harmonic case, would be constant. In the anharmonic case, they now become functions of times. And this con the connection between these modes and molecular dynamics is this notion of modal analysis. Let's see how I'm doing on time. All right. And so what we want to do is we want to essentially do, you can think of it like a Fourier transform. In a Fourier transform, what you do is you take some signal, some oscillatory signal, and you do an inner product between that and a periodic function such as sine or cosine, and you essentially answer the question mathematically of, to what extent does my signal match this function that I'm testing it against? You do an integration in time, and it will give you a number that essentially tells you to what extent that signal has that particular function as part of its content, the content of that, of that signal. And so we're going to do the same thing where we're going to take the anharmonic motions, and at every instant, we're going to measure to what extent is one mode actually excited at this instant versus any other mode. And we can get the full array, the full spectrum of how the modes are excited. And now, that means we can track the mode amplitudes in time. We can actually see dynamically how the mode amplitudes evolve. So we're going to think of the lattice dynamic solutions, the solutions in the harmonic limit, this will be our basis. All right, think of that as your basis set. The molecular dynamics is your signal. This is your actual anharmonic signal. And the modal analysis is the projection of the signal onto the basis, similar to for a Fourier transform. All right, so what we're going to do here is convert the trajectory, so the positions and velocities of all the atoms, into what we call modal coordinates, right, where now we're representing that trajectory in essentially this Fourier space. So we're moving from individual atom motions to describing them in terms of collective atom motion amplitudes. And so this projection process is equivalent to essentially multiplying and then summing. All right? So what does this look like? I want to go through this very carefully and slowly so it really roots deeply in your mind exactly what it is we're doing. So at a given instant, uh, let's say R1. I wrote R1, but let's, let's think of it as velocity you could think of for, for a given uh, instant. You have this velocity or this vector. This is how the atom is actually moving. This is its actual velocity. And then you have, for every mode, remember you have this list of vectors. And so for every solution, you have a list of vectors that tells you for every single atom, this is how far it will move in this particular direction as it participates in that collective solution. So that gives me one vector on one atom that I can compare the actual velocity to. 
And how do I do this comparison? I do a dot product. So I do a dot product between the two vectors that gives me the magnitude of the two vectors times the cosine theta between them. What does this mean? Why does this work? So if R1 or R2, if either of the vectors is large, then the dot product will be large. If R1 and R2 happen to point in the same direction, that's when this dot product is maximized. So it means that if the atom is actually moving in the direction that corresponds exactly to the direction that it should be moving, if it was participating in this collective mode, in this mode, this normal mode, this solution, then I'll get a big number, okay? And that big number will tell me that that atom is fully described by that mode. Conversely, if these things point in opposite directions, I get minus that number, but I still get a big number. So they can be out of phase. They can be going in opposite directions. Conversely, if they're perpendicular, I get zero. So if this atom happens to be moving in exactly the perpendicular direction as the direction of that mode, I get zero. I get no contribution to that mode. And so all we do is we sum over atoms. So you got here, this is, let's say, the velocity of an atom, or uh, this could be velocity or position. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, here's velocity, here's position. So you got the position of an atom. Remember, this is polarization vector. This index n here represents which of the mode solutions. So this is the nth solution to the equations of motion. So it's the nth mode. All right, the nth mode has a certain vector associated with this atom j. So I take that atom j, it's, an, it's exact position or its displacement from its equilibrium position, multiply by that polarization vector, and I sum over all atoms. I repeat this process for all the atoms, and that gives me a number that represents the amplitude of that mode. So just think about this conceptually. If I start with a system of atoms, no atom is moving at this instant. If I calculate, so all the displacements of all the atoms are zero, what is it going to tell me? It's going to tell me every mode's amplitude is zero. OK. So now if I pick a mode, let's say the nth mode, I start, I displace all the atoms, give them a displacement corresponding to the exact vector that I have here. If I now calculate the amplitudes of all the modes, I'm going to get one number for the mode that is, is, is imparted to the system, and I'm going to get exactly zero for every other mode because these modes are orthogonal. Does that make sense? OK. I'll assume, I'll assume no hands means this all makes sense. This all jives. All right, same thing goes for velocity. You can project the velocity onto the normal mode shapes and get a velocity coordinate. And so you can now describe the system trajectory in terms of positions and velocity coordinates for the modes. So let me just review this kind of conceptually. So imagine you had this signal here in gray. This is your signal. This is your basis in blue. This is one particular uh, frequency sine wave that you can model it against. And you can calculate by doing an integral in time, this is equivalent to our sum over atoms, to determine how, to what extent this signal is similar to this, uh, to, to this function. To what, so essentially what we're measuring is to what extent is the gray and the blue function similar. The bigger the number we get, the more similar they are. And so in this case, you get a strong component because you get a magnitude on the order of 10 to the fifth. I could choose another sine wave, for example, that's less so participating, uh, uh, has less content in this signal. You get a smaller number on the order of 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4. I could pick another frequency, small component, right? I get another small number on the order of 10 to the 4. I could pick another frequency, again, high frequency, but this one happens to be strongly inside this signal. So this is the, this is the product, and then I'm summing it. And you can see that it's offset from 0, so that's why this integral just keeps getting bigger, so I get a big component. And so it's not obvious. If I just show you this gray uh, signal, it may not be obvious that this frequency, which is even hard to see, is deeply inside that signal, has a very strong component inside that signal. And this is one of the reasons that normal mode analysis is so useful, is because it can tell you which modes are actually excited at a given instant, how they're behaving, how they're oscillating, and to what extent they're exchanging energy with other modes. And this is why it's so useful, is because if I show you the dynamics, if you just look at the atom dynamics, it just looks like a bunch of balls bouncing around. It doesn't look like any particular mode is excited. But embedded in that, because you have many, many modes, this, this process is very, very uh, useful. All right. So I think I'm ready to stop for this first half of the talk. I have a few minutes for questions. Uh, I want to start here with the next talk, but I'm going to do this one slide, then we'll come back to it again. We'll start here again. So why is this modal analysis useful? Again, as I was just explaining, being able to do this conversion 
between the, nor the actual atomic trajectory, which if you just look at it, looks random, to this conversion to the normal mode trajectory where you're actually following the amplitudes of individual modes is very, very powerful. Because what it allows us to do is follow the dynamics of an individual mode, which has a certain frequency associated with it. Why is that important? Well, because these classical molecular dynamics simulations do not account for quantum effects. So when we can later correct for quantum effects, which are going to depend on frequency. So we need to know what contributions different modes of different frequency are making to the transport coefficient to properly apply a quantum correction. You have to know if the low frequency modes are contributing you know, 50% or if they're contributing 5%. Once you know that, you can then scale the co co corresponding contributions associated with each normal mode accordingly, according to uh, quantum statistics. So I'll show you in the next half of the talk what we can learn that is new from all this modal analysis and why it's so useful. All right, thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions you have. I guess the question um, I have has to do with reversibility. Um, the equations of motion that you describe are all reversible. Um, so even though you have lots of motions, eventually things will go back to the initial position. How do you introduce irreversibility, which is essential for definition of the temperature? How do you, rever how do you reduce reverse irreversi uh, reversibility? Because you're saying it's central to the definition of temperature? Well, if you want to define temperature, you need to have irreversibility, but Newton's equations are reversible. We should probably have a detailed conversation about why you, why you feel that temperature is inherently coupled to this notion of irreversibility. I would, I would, I would agree that thermodynamic irreversibility is, is coupled to this notion of temperature, but I don't know that that necessarily translates to microscopic irreversibility of a trajectory. So in general, you're right, right? We can run, you could run these MD simulations forward in time or backward in time. It really doesn't matter, right? And so a lot, a lot of times what we do is we start with a configuration where the atoms are at some equilibrium site. We kick them off with certain velocities and we go forward in time, but we could equally go backwards in time. You could go 10 nanoseconds forward and then push rewind and you'll go back through that state where they were all at exactly the equilibrium positions, but it will just be for one instant because then they're going to immediately go somewhere else. So I don't know that there's anything particularly special or bad about that poor starting state. We also don't have to start there. We can randomly displace the atoms and start from another configura configuration that is more likely. Very often what we do when we do these calculations is we will start from that odd state and we will change ensembles. So you might start in NPT, allow the volume to relax, and then switch to NVE. And in that sense, you know, if you were then to run the dynamics backwards in NVE, but not switch back to NPT, you would not go back to the original state. So there's some tricks we can play that in, pra in actual practice, I don't think cause any problems with uh, irreversibility, but you raise, I think, a very deep, interesting theoretical question I think I wanna, I wanna talk with you in detail about. Um, I have a question about the, the detailed dynamics a scattering process. So uh, everyone knows that the MD simulation is deterministic. So as you said that, okay, if you fix the initial position and velocity, and then definitely you will go, or, or, or you know where the system will go, right? Uh, so I was wondering, since we also know that the uh, scattering channels or something like that from the, some other technique, for example, like a BT or the harmonic electric dynamics. So is it possible that we couple with the uh, Classic MD, and then we know that how exactly from the beginning we know the final modes, and then how exactly each mode is scattered, which mode, and then so on. And I have this one. Um, okay. In short, I think what you're saying is possible. Um, what we can definitely do, for example, I could give you one. I'll give you one example where it's easy to see that uh, when you're at finite room temperature. I think we may need some new tools to actually map which modes are interacting instantaneously, but I don't think it's impossible to do that. So let's say you take an initial, um, and I, I actually have movies of this, um, an initial simulation where only one mode is excited, okay? And 
as I showed you, if it's one mode and the amplitude is small enough, it'll just stay in that one mode indefinitely. All right, so imagine as I'm watching the MD simulation, I make a corresponding movie plot of what is the amplitude of every mode in the system. Okay? Now I could say, all right, well, let me start with that and I'll perturb one extra atom and I'll just give it a, kick it off a little bit and move it in some other direction not corresponding to that mode. What will happen is now on my plot, I'll largely have one big spike that corresponds to the main mode that's excited and then I'll get a, a bunch of other little tiny peaks associated with other modes that are now trying to describe this other atom that has actually started moving. If I watch that evolve in time, what I'm going to see is the one mode, its energy, its amplitude is going to start to decrease, and you'll see other ones start to pick up. And so you'll actually see which modes it's, so to speak, interacting with. But this interaction is continuous. And so I think that there's a, this is part of the part that I'm saying is disjoint, because you're not going to see a scattering event. You're not going to see one amplitude, and then all of a sudden it decreases, and a bunch of stuff just shows up. It's going to be very continuous. It's going to be slow. And that is the scattering event. So what, what this to me makes us, leads us to want to question is whether or not this notion of scattering is realistic in the first place. Because if the scattering event takes equally as long as the time between the scattering events, then scattering itself is probably not the right physical picture. Because they're not really hitting each other and there's this quick interaction and then nothing happens. It's like they're continuously interacting the whole time. And so maybe there's a different physical picture that's a better descriptor of what that actually is like, rather than treating it like it's gas molecules that you know, bounce from each other. Yeah, but in the equivalent MD, we do can uh, extract the relaxing time of each mode, right? Sure. By the, for example, like a TDMMA or SED technique. Yeah. But so this relaxation. That, definitely, but, so in principle, we should be able to extract the, the details of the final scattering in, in this concept. Or, Sure. The details of this process. Sure, but the, all, all I'm pointing out is that the, yeah, yes, you can do that. You can get a relaxation time. All I'm saying is that that relaxation time in the context of MD actually corresponds to the attenuation time, right? So it's a different, it's a different physical picture to say something is continuously decaying versus it's traveling and then changes trajectory and keeps moving around very discreetly. That's not physically what's happening. What's more consistent with the physical picture is that these modes are continuously interacting and that energy gradually gets pulled out of those modes and dissipates. And it's a continuous process. And we can measure that time and we can make an analogy. We can take that time we calculate and project it onto a different physical picture and say, oh, okay, well, that's equivalent to the set amount of time that I had between scattering events. I'm simply saying that I think there's a lot of value in relinquishing the adherence to this model that it has to be like scattering. I think we just need to let it go because it's not physically what's happening and I think we'll get a lot more insight if we let that go and actually think about what's really happening. Okay, thank you. I have a question about the slide of amorphous solid. It'll take a while to get back there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, how could we determine the red line frequency, the boundary between uh, propagons and diffusions? So I'll show that a little bit later, but I'll, let me go ahead and answer your question now. Um, so to Kayvon's point, it's not an actual boundary in frequency. There is a frequency regime where we tend to see the character change a lot. Uh, but how it is we do that is we've come up with a method, we have a paper on it in, uh, in JAP. Basically, what we, we came up with was a methodology to actually measure an individual mode's character. And so what we say is we say, okay, I have these eigenvectors here. And what I will do is I will, exp with these eigenvectors, I will now explore every possible plane wave I can think of, every spatial frequency, every direction, and every possible phase. And I'll do the inner product between that plane wave and the actual mode eigenvectors. And whichever one gives me the biggest inner product is the best match I get. And whenever I find that best match, I now normalize that value by that plane wave's uh, inner product with itself. And what that tells me is to what extent, what fraction or what percentage of that mode's vibration actually resembles an actual plane wave. So you get one when it actually is a perfect plane wave. You get 100% propagating or plane wave-like character. And then when you get something like this, it approaches zero. It gets really, really low. And so we measure that now on a universal scale between 0 and 1, 
And so I can show you, yeah, let me go ahead and show you an example. Um, here we go. We do this for a bunch of modes in a system. So here, for example, this is crystalline germanium. All the modes are up here near 100%. These are all propagating like modes, all plane waves. Then when we go to amorphous germanium, you get this. So most of the modes are down here. These are diffusons and locons. And there's this kind of transition frequency region, right? You see some different uh, character down in here. Oops, excuse me. But what's interesting is then if we do crystalline silicon versus amorphous silicon, you see you get a bunch of diffusons down here, but you still get some propagons that are even higher frequencies. Okay? So it's not a rigid cutoff frequency, but rather we think it's important to actually assess each mode on an individual basis rather than saying I have to look at all the modes to determine where is some cutoff frequency. Thank you very much, very, very great talk. So normal bone decomposition method gives you the uh, relaxation time of single mode, but on the other hand, Adam Feldman theory, so that is uh, not single mode, that is the mixture of the two modes, right? So if we want to uh, connecting the normal mode decomposition results in the Adam Feldman method, and uh, let's say that if we convert, if we uh, calculate the diffusivity, from Adam Feldman, Adam Feldman um, Kage, Kage, uh, how, how to, so, so let me see, let me again. Uh, so normal model decomposition method, the, uh, recording the time dependent single mode energy, so auto correlation time gives you the relaxation time. Mm -hmm. So I want to uh, connect the relaxation time to diffusivity, but uh, uh, definition of the group velocity is very difficult in the, in the system. So, because there's no wave vector, so how to connect the normal model of the competition results into RNF results? All right, good, good, good question. You guys are skipping ahead to the second talk, but uh, I'll just go ahead and show you some of the stuff. It'll just be repeating when I show it a second time, but maybe, maybe it'll be useful to see it again. So, um, all right, so let me answer your question very explicitly. You said, how can I connect the normal, mean, normal mode decomposition to Alan Feldman. So the way I would describe the Alan Feldman approach, as you'll see later when I talk about how we do this for thermal conductivity, it's essentially in spirit, it's the same thing, except now we've brought in the anharmonicity. So their approach was an analytical derivation of what are the thermal conductivity contributions in the harmonic limit. So they neglected anharmonicity so they could actually solve it. One of the things that comes out of that solution is that they end up with this like delta function. So it essentially tells you that only modes that happen to be very, very close in frequency are able to interact. And it's only the degree to which they overlap that actually gives you a substantial diffusivity. So the two, the two requirements are two modes kind of have to exist in the same location. The dot products of the vectors kind of have to be similar for them for the, to get to some significant interaction. And the frequencies have to be similar. What you'll see when, when we finish here uh, I'll just show you this plot. We generate these two-dimensional correlation plots. So the Allen-Feldman result largely corresponds to the diagonal. So it's these correlations that show up between modes that have the same frequency. Right? So this is frequency of one mode correlated with another frequency of, 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 another, of a, another mode of a different frequency. So the diagonal represents the same frequency. Uh, so we have seen, I don't know that, so there's a little bit of ambiguity here or a little bit of hand-waving here. We have seen that um, in two cases, I think it's two cases, where when we do our calculations, which have the anharmonicity, it turns out if you actually compare our diagonal summations to the Allen Feldman results, they actually are the same value. Very interesting. Now, our approach says that even the same frequencies could be interacting anharmonically. So I, I wouldn't say they rigorously need to be the same, but they could be interrelated in that way. Now, there's something else that you hinted at which I want to address, which is this notion of calculating a relaxation time. And I think maybe what you meant, or maybe what you were getting at, is maybe you could take the diffusivities of the modes that you calculate here or via Allen Feldman, calculate a mode relaxation time, and somehow back out a velocity, where you treat diffusivity like it's v squared times tau. Uh, 
I'll, I'll, I want to defer to, so I don't want to ruin the punchline later, but I'll show, I'll show you some examples uh, where we essentially see that that, essentially, that doesn't work. <laughs> um, you can do it, you can construct a number, but it doesn't mean anything. So we actually have a paper on this, uh, it's called Examining the Validity of the Phonon Gas Model for, I think, amorphous materials. And what we show is that if you do that, you get negative velocities. Not only do you get, uh, not, not even, I'm sorry, not negative velocities, you get imaginary velocities, because it's V squared. So V squared has to be negative in order for that to make sense. Another thing that happens out of that is that the velocities become enormous. You get some modes that are contributing so much for the short relaxation times they have, the velocities would exceed the, seat, the speed of sound by like factors of 10. Doesn't make any kind of sense. So what we have come to understand or appreciate is that we think this approach is rigorous on its own, and you'll run into a lot of trouble when you try to marry it with something else, the old view, or trying to insist that relaxation times are useful or that they're meaningful. This seems to describe things well on its own without having to be compared to anything else other than experiments, and I'll, and I'll show that later. Thanks. Uh, in the interest of time, let's thank uh, uh, Henry uh, again. Uh, thank you. And I'm looking forward to your talk in the afternoon. So our uh, next speaker is, uh, there's a break or not? I thought, oh, I thought, uh, OK, yeah, that's right. Yeah. OK, we have a break. The next talk is at 11 <laughs> uh, by Dr. Thank you.